Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Jack Billings of Shed Knives. Like many new businesses, Shed Knives came of age during the pandemic, born out of a passion and the free time to develop it. In the few years since, Shed has developed a catalog of knives and a bustling business. I've had the Shed Knives U.S. Tonto 2023 model and can vouch for its impressive capabilities with carving, batoning, and feather sticking. And I made a couple of backyard usage videos with that knife, something I rarely do, uh, if you need the proof. Uh, we'll find out how Shed got its start and what its plans are. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and share the show with a friend. And as always, if you'd like to help support the show, you can do so on Patreon. Quickest way to do that is click the scan the QR code or go to the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's the knifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie, probably worse. Hello, sir. How are you, Jack? Oh, I am doing great. How are you today? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. Uh, as I mentioned up front, uh, I you sent me the U.S. Tonto uh, 2023 model, and uh, I I I opened it up, pulled it out of the box, and I was like, okay, this looks rough and ready. Let's see what it can do. I took it out back, and in in my way, bashed on it and put it through its paces, and I was very impressed. Congratulations on an awesome knife and uh, your company. Thank you. Well, I certainly appreciate it. Uh, a lot has gone into the 2023 collection, and uh, I'm glad you got some great use out of it, like uh, in the videos you posted. So definitely some great use there, and that's what I make them for. Awesome. All right. Well, let's let's talk about how you got into knives in the first place and and how you started this business. Yes. So I started making knives as a hobby in 2018 and uh, it really came about. I was sitting on the couch watching some YouTube videos and uh, my friend Sam was there. We're just looking stuff up online and uh, he was like, oh, let's look up how to make knives so we start watching some videos uh we came across a youtube channel that was making a forge uh the king of random and uh, he was making a forge to melt aluminum cans we were like you know that seems pretty easy to do at the time i was 13 he was 14 and uh we're like oh let's do it so we built our first forge on the very first try and uh, then just started making knives after that. So really started from YouTube and the internet and uh, turned into a business from there. I love that. Uh, I mean, your business, when you look at your website and when you look at the uh, paperwork you send and your packaging, it's very polished and it, it, it looks like it's very well developed. But I love hearing uh, the, of the sort of raw beginnings. You said you made a forge and it was easy. Uh, That's I made, right. <laughs> I've made one of those uh, number 10 coffee can forges, and I did not have such an easy time, and I was way older than 13. Uh, uh, tell, me, <laughs> tell me about how, how you made that forge, and, and then what did you use it for? You were, were you forging stuff out, or did you just use that to heat treat? Yeah, so uh, let's see. To answer the first question, how I actually made it there, well, I got a tin can, roughly like maybe a four-gallon tin can, slightly smaller than a five-gallon bucket, uh, but it was an aluminum can, and as you know, aluminum melts very fast. Uh, well, there's a river by my house that has clay, so we were like, oh, let's just line the thing with clay, 
stick a tin can in the center of it, drill a couple holes in to get airflow, and so we can stick our sword in, because the first project that we ever did was a, uh, a sword. So I found a piece of metal in the woods, and uh, instead of making a knife or something like that, I was like, oh, let's just go straight to a sword. <laughs> so made a sword. That was the very first thing. Uh, but for what I used it for, it started as just heating raw metal pretty much and then hammering it out uh but because uh it is pretty loud uh we were like uh you know we can do this a better way so i ended up using the forge just for heat treating and that was really the majority of the the use for it it also burns stuff very fast so really good way of uh just burning firewood if i had any extra but uh yeah th the forge really got a ton of use over the years uh so uh, as you're talking about this uh it it made me think or it made me wonder you know you and i are of different generations uh i know what got me into knives uh besides my grandpa and stuff from very very early age it was the rambo movies it was the arnold schwarzenegger movies of the 80s and uh, maybe a little bit of the 90s what um from your perspective you went straight to sword and i love that uh <laughs> making a katana right out of the gate what what uh kind of culturally got you into knives yes yeah, so really it was the boy scouts that's what got me into it i started as a tiger scout and worked all the way up uh to boy scouts and i got my first knife i believe as a bear so three or four years into the scouting program so then i started carrying a small little folder um just you know something cheap if i lose it or break it then no big deal but i started carrying a knife then and i really started getting into it by just small projects like whittling uh making tent stakes just stuff like that and uh then seeing the older scouts when i got into the actual boy scout program seeing them carry fixed blades and larger knives mm -hmm. I was like, huh there there is something cool with this so then i started building my collection over the years and uh yes yeah, so really it was the boy scouts that that really developed that passion uh, but I also get it from my dad. He has been a big uh, knife collector for I don't know how long now, just ever since he was in the Scouts as well. Uh, but he really helped uh, grow that passion for knives as well. So what kind of skills did you pick up in the Boy Scouts and maybe from your father uh, that you that you uh, that you do with a knife that are invaluable? Yes. Yeah, so. A ton of stuff, really. Uh, wilderness survival was a big one. Uh, in the Boy Scout program, we would go to summer camp every year. And every year, I took the same merit badge, wilderness survival, where you build a shelter, you use limited resources, and I absolutely love that. So that is something that they said, yeah, you, you get a knife and you get the outdoors. So build a shelter, get to it. And uh, year after year, and outside of the camping, of course, uh, on my own time, I kept uh, refining those wilderness skills. Uh, and then also another part, which really is very different compared to wilderness survival, is sailing. I was a sailing instructor at Rodney Scout Reservation for a year, and uh, a knife really came in handy because if you get tied up in uh, some line on the boat, that can be really dangerous. So I always kept a knife right on my life jacket there. And uh, yeah, so all sorts of uses that the program showed uh, you can use a knife for. So how does that experience, and now I'm, I'm, my curiosity is really piqued about the sailing bit um, uh, because your knives do not in any way strike me as floating, <laughs> floating yes. knives. Um, no, but uh, it's interesting because we talk a lot on this show about um, outdoor camping, survival usage, combat usage, self-defense usage, and we have never, I don't think we've once spoken uh, about it in a maritime uh, context. How, 
we we can see how some of that outdoors stuff goes into that but tell me like what goes into the design of these knives and how does that sailing bit work in yes so the sailing bit uh that actually came in from someone i sent a knife to it was weird i designed my knives to be used primarily in a wilderness survival setting in a bushcraft setting uh, but I sent a knife to a kayak fisherman, and this was in 2019. I sent him a knife, and it didn't have a lanyard hole. So he drill bit after drill bit, he <laughs> broke up like seven or eight of them, and sent me a message. He's like, Jack, could you please put a lanyard hole in the knife? I, I cooked so many drill bits. I'm like, oh, man, that's that's a good idea. So fast forward. I have a half inch lanyard hole in each knife and I started doing that in 2021. Um, smaller holes were put in years before, but I decided the half inch lanyard hole works best because bringing up the sailing, uh, the line is not like 550 cord, it's usually very thick. Uh, mm -hmm. So having a half inch lanyard hole, you can get the thicker pieces of rope in there and that way you drop your knife, well, you just pull the line in and you got your knife. Well, since it's in hand, let's see the knife that you've got right there. Yeah, Yeah. so this right here, this is the 2023 Shed Knives Conquest. This knife, the uh, design actually came out in 2021 and uh, it actually came out like halfway through the year where usually I just release the knives all at once but this one here is very special it's more of a self-defense knife or everyday carry uh for a couple different reasons one you have a tanto uh, blade there which is really helpful for an everyday carry because you have a point not just there but also down there so it helps with uh dulling the knife well you have a backup point then for the self-defense part you have this beautiful curve right there on the knife where you have jimping there for your thumb so you can push into something you also have a stop there for your finger where not all knives in the 2023 line have that stop for your finger where this your hand is locked in and also the curving uh, on the handle here on the blank it fits the hand really well and it has a nice solid feel so there's the 2023 uh, shed knives conquest okay that's that's cool uh first of all congratulations on that knife that's a cool <laughs> thank you it's a very cool looking knife my tastes definitely uh um lean towards the tactical and the self-defense and the combat I, yeah um and so naturally um when i got the 2023 tanto uh, I'm all, you know, feeling feeling how it is in the Filipino grip with that jimping. Your jimping is awesome, by the way. Thank um, you. I like large jimping, um, and this is large, but it's this is more like medium jimping, where whereas a tops they're almost too big and too far spaced apart. Um, right. Anyway, what I was getting at it was even though this is not that kind of knife, every knife can be that kind of knife. I try tried it in this position and commented on one of the videos how I like that for hooking the thumb over the top. Yes. It looks like you have that in the Conquest. Yes. So the 2023 line has a bunch of similarities spread through all of the knives. And I'll pull out a few here just to show some of the similarities. So all of them have the same steel, same handle. Uh, they're all fairly similar in materials. Um, all of them have that... Uh, top is curved part on the, the very rear of the handle there. The top is curved. The bottom is a nice, I'll call it like a soft point because it won't cut you or, or anything, but it still is a point. So all of the 2023 models have that same concept, um, which like you, like you pointed out, you can curve, uh, curl up there with your thumb and uh, really is a nice point there. You can also crack stuff open and like in a self-defense situation using the blade may not always be the best 
uh, choice for all those who are watching who know uh, the, the steps of self-defense. There's starting just from a verbal point and then moving to lethal force. Well, you don't just jump from point one all the way to the end. You work your way up. And sometimes just using an impact point can get the job done without uh, serious damage and, and harming other people where it might not be needed. So I threw that in there uh, just for that self-defense part as well. The noggin knocker. I like it. Yeah. You know, yes. sometimes you just kind of straighten someone out, I guess. Not, <laughs> not that I've ever had to, thank God. Right. Uh, but, Same here. But but I, I do like that. Um, and then an, another thing that I like about your designs that, uh, um, well, there are a number of things, um, but I like how the scales sit and, and the tang is slightly proud of the scales. Um, yes. And then the scales themselves are nicely contoured. They feel very comfortable and very hand filling. Um, in this case, uh, I haven't tried all your knives, but very hand filling, but not too big and fat. Right, right. Yeah, I use the same thickness on all of the scales there. Uh, so they're all roughly a quarter inch thick on each side. So the scales together are about a half inch thick, uh, then thrown on the knife. And they're all curved on the sides. They have a nice radius there uh, because some knives I've seen, even some of my first knives I made, the corners or the edges were not rounded. And uh, over time, using them in a hard use situation, you start to feel different points of the knife where if you're just holding it and doing normal things, opening a letter, uh, whatever simple task it may be, you, you won't notice it. So over time and over using the knives, um, the, I was like, oh, we, we have to round the, the corners there to this specific type there because there's all different types of ways to round the corners. Uh, but through testing, I found this is the best way. So how do you make your knives? Take us through it. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so uh, for this line here, it's actually very different than the years before. And uh, I can get into the years before in a second. But for this year's line, the blanks, I designed uh, the actual design. So that's something I do myself every single year. Uh, then I sent the design to a water jet company. They cut out the design for me mail me the blank just the blank and uh, then from there uh, i put it on a jig where i get this nice hollow grind on all of the knives here so get a nice hollow grind and uh, put it on the jig there then i throw it in a stone washer so uh, puts a cool finish on there it makes it look uh, mm -hmm. sort of gray like a light gray dark gray depends on how the light hits it really uh, so put it in the stone washer there after doing the hollow grind and then uh, while it's in the stone wash i start with g10 time so the g10 i cut out into uh little blanks i get it in pretty big sheets and uh then i just cut them out uh trill them do the counter bore on there and uh then by that time the g10 scale is finished the knife is done being stone washed piece the two together do the Kydex, uh, which is actually pretty simple. This is uh, my first year with all the knives having Kydex sheaths with them. And then uh, after that, do my finishing touches, and the knives are ready to go. Nice. Well, what were they in before, uh, before they were all in Kydex? What else did you offer? Yes, yeah, so before I offered leather sheaths, uh, that was something I had somebody else making the sheaths. Um, but I decided, you know, leather can tear. Uh, you can stab a knife through a leather sheath. Um, yeah. A lot of bushcrafters really like leather. Uh, but through field testing and through people who actually use the knives said, you know, a Kydex sheath would be really great because you can adjust the, the clips on them where leather you're confined to one setup. Uh, also, you can clean them very easily, just a little soap and water, and you clean a Kydex sheath. So Kydex has so many pros to it, I decided, you know, I, I have to switch to it. It's the best decision. 
Yeah, I I uh I love Kydex, um, especially on outdoor knives, but also on EDC knives. And and this one is kind of uh well, it's sort of uh depending on your lifestyle, this could be EDC. Kind of where I live, it's a little too much. Um yeah. uh, but but Kydex is nice because um you can readjust it too. That's another thing. If it starts to loosen, you can just hit it with a with a gun and reheat, you know, with a heat gun and get it, uh, right. you know, nicely molded back in. And, um, so this, this is a stock removal style of, um, of, of knife making. How do you do the heat treat? Yes. Yeah, so the heat treat, how I get the steel, it is already to a very high rock. Well, um, it's in the, the high fifties there. So it's already at a spot where I was surprised when I tested it, I was like, Oh, I guess I don't have to heat treat it, which is usually not the case whatsoever. Um, so I don't have to heat treat it now. It's already at such a hard point where um, I mean, it's it really impressed me when I first got the steel. It's a 154 cm, so very popular steel. A lot of people know it very well, and uh, it's it's just tough. It's stuff you can use. It's also a steel you can sharpen, which if you're using some of the uh, S35VN type steels, they can be hard to sharpen sometimes, especially for uh, people who aren't used to sharpening knives, where the 154 cm, it is a great steel for both use and for maintaining. So you're you're saying that wait wait was this CPM one fifty four or one one fifty four? Yeah. So yeah. The first batch I did was CPM one fifty four. Then mm -hmm. because of price differences and and there were some issues I had to work out, I uh, moved to one fifty four CM. So I did move to that. Uh, so it was just the first batch that had CPM, uh, but still pretty similar steels uh but the core of it just great stuff to use in the field yeah i love uh 154 uh whether it's cpm or cm is one of my favorite steels i have a lot of knives in this blade steel um it is tough i can't say i've taken any of the other knives i have in in uh, 154 and batoned with it which is what i was doing with this and and you're telling me you did not heat treat this Correct. I did not heat treat it. And uh, like I said, I was very impressed when I when I was working the knives in the field for the first time, that first run. Um, I was like, no way. Um, but yeah, and that was actually a suggestion for my dad. I was like, oh, I got to change my heat treat process because it's a, it's a higher quality steel. It's like, just test it first and see what you need to adjust. I was like, oh. Well, after the testing, after the results, there's no need to. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, uh, it's really shocking to me. I'm, I, I'm, I'm a little <laughs> flabbergasted. I got to say, uh, because in, in my mind, if you don't heat treat it, it, you hit it, it's like hitting a stick of butter against wood. Uh, obviously not. Um, this is, this, this has impressive qualities and, uh, it's still uh, paper, paper cutting sharp. Uh, that's my yes. lame test for ju for just you know kind of feeling where there are snags and there is a you know there's a slight glinting somewhere in here oh it's up towards the front that's right where i where it landed on a rock um yes so that's okay all right so um then you got to tell me what kind of testing what were you doing out in the field where you determined you're like this is like good just how it is yes so when I test a knife, I go crazy with testing a knife. Uh, I start simple, you know, cut some rope, just the simple stuff. But then I get into the chopping, uh, taking a uh, six to eight inch thick piece of wood and just chopping right through it uh, like an axe, something you would do with an axe. Just mm -hmm. chop, chop, chop. Then, for example, uh, the point here, you've seen the cold steel videos they stab it into a piece of wood and they start rocking it uh, back. So that's what I did just over and over trying to destroy the knife, trying to break it. And uh, I didn't break any points off, didn't break any uh, uh, tips of the blade, nothing. And uh, really impressed me. Uh, no, even hammering the knife straight into a piece of wood and then 
hammering it left, right, just trying to bend it. Um, mm. I mean, seriously, and any way I can try to, to break my knife, I try. And uh, with this year's line, I, I was not successful, <laughs> which is a good thing. Yeah, no kidding. Well, okay, so you have a, a, a line of knives now. You have a, a, a nice size catalog, like, well, I don't know, 10 knives or so, 10 models, something yeah, like so that. Yes, there are seven knives. Yeah, very close. Mm -hmm. There are seven knives for this year. Uh, every year I release a new uh, line of knives. Uh, I'm not sure if you know, but I am a big car enthusiast. Mm -hmm. And the whole line of knives idea came from the automotive industry. I thought, you know, if the automotive companies release a new line of cars each year and uh, they're all improved and they all have new features and a new look i do the same exact thing with my knives each year they look completely different than the year before so i thought name it like a vehicle you have the year 2023 <laughs> easy to identify over time the make shed knives and then the model so uh, pretty easy to figure out as we are all very um uh I guess, familiar with uh, vehicle manufacturer names and, and how they uh, put dates on their, their models. So I thought, let me do the same. I like that. That's a, that's a, uh, a like you said, a familiar way of doing it. And um, I've noticed a lot of knife makers connect their passion for cars, especially uh, with their passion yes. for knives. Um well, since we're actually on that topic, uh, you, you uh, sponsored a, a race, team is that right yes yes i sponsored two teams uh i have shed knives racing i started that in 2020 as a way of getting shed knives into the industry because i noticed uh through dirt track racing which is what i sponsored um a lot of the people who watch dirt track races they're also outdoor enthusiasts they love to camp they love to hunt they like to fish and what type of knives do i sell that same category so what better way to get uh my brand in front of my clientele than racing and it's also fun to watch yeah it is it is it's fun to do too <laughs> yeah uh, on the <laughs> on the streets around where i live apparently they love doing that uh but <laughs> um so uh the the racing and the and the the knife thing or i, I should say uh cars and knives uh, very definitely you see a parallel between them um yes but your your knives you're not doing a complete redesign very much like the car industry that there, there is a um you know a memory of the knife before as it moves forward how do you right. evolve your your designs one year to the next do you sit down at a pad of paper or does it come from working metal what do you do so i sit down with a, a normal sheet of paper, nothing crazy. And uh, just, I look at the knives I have made, I lay them all out, I keep one of each model uh, year after year, and I, I set them all down. And uh, for example, I brought a 2022 sheep's foot. As you can see, is very different from the 2023 sheep's foot, but it's also similar in some aspects as well so i lay them all down and uh i i start writing or drawing the general shape so as you can see here the sheep's foot the 2022 has a pretty similar shape to the 2023 but then i start improving uh small things like the the back of it you can see it's just you know an oval pretty much got the half inch linear hole or i thought let me add some uh different components here let me change the shape of it let me change the geometry so uh i start adding small things that uh over time over dozens and dozens of designs uh specifically with this one i probably did 35 or 40 designs before i landed this one um it's just drawing over and over and over until i find one that locks i'm like this is it. And then I put it into production and uh, which is just doing it all by hand to see how it how it works, how it looks. Um, and then through that as well, I'm all about constant improvement and uh, 
every year I have constantly improving uh, designs, but even my process, as I make the knife, as I make the new knife, I see, oh, I can uh, take a minute off of this process while maintaining quality. Oh, I can improve quality uh, with this additional step. Oh, look at that. Uh, so there's all sorts of things I look at, uh, both in the knife itself and the time behind the knife. I look at all those things on how to improve. So uh, to finish up the answer here, Yes, I design the knife, but I also design the process as well. I write the process down and see, oh, I can do this a little different. Oh, I can add this. I can subtract that. So, uh, yeah, so just just a uh, constant improvement is uh, what I'm going for. So when you made the change from uh, uh, wrapped handles to handle scales, uh, was that a business decision or was that uh, an ergonomics uh, quality of feel kind of decision? So it, it was a ton of things, really. At Blade Show in Atlanta, I set up uh, last year, so 2022, I set up and a lot of people liked the 550 cord. They were really into it. Uh, but they said, you know, for next year, how about G10? We love G10. It's a great material. Try working that. And uh, then I started messing with it a little bit. And I was like, actually, this is a great addition here. There's nothing wrong with a 550 cord handle here. There's nothing wrong with it. You can take the 550 cord off and use it for so many things. But the G10 is great because you get a better grip. And uh, I also made it so you have interchangeable parts. The screws in the handle itself are the same screws in the sheath here that uh, put the clip on. So if you lose a screw in the clip, which sometimes that happens, you know, you're out in the fields, you knock it against something, you break a screw, you just pull the center one out. And boom, you have a, an interchangeable part, which I have not seen with any other knife company. And uh, if someone can show me a company who's done it, I'd love to see it. But until then, um, this is a first. Well, I love that. And, uh, you know, most knife nerds do love some some form of universal hardware. Uh, but that usually comes into play uh, mostly with folders. So it's, it's uh, right. yeah, it's cool to hear that. Uh, that that's a part of your um, planning uh, in in the designs. When you started uh, way back when, you had partners, uh, and you ended yes. up uh, carrying the torch. Um, do you work alone now, or do you have uh, do you have others that you work with? Yes. Yeah, so uh, you're right. I did start with a team. I started with two friends, and uh, then that team grew to eight people. I had eight other people working for me. And uh, then at that time, it was really around the pandemic, um, around 2020, 2021. Um, I, it was actually a good point. I was thinking, I was like, you know, I can do a lot of this myself. I want to really dive into the process itself and learn it and find how to improve it. And uh, the eight other people I had on the team, it was, we were all 15, 16 years old. And so, you know, interests changed very fast. So they wanted to move on to bigger and better things. So it worked out really good for all of us. Uh, but today I do all, I do everything myself, all the marketing, all the content, uh, all the production, I do it all myself. There are a few things I outsource, like uh, cutting out the, the water, or water jetting the blanks, stuff like that. I I outsource, uh, but that's that's not much in in the uh, big picture there. So, uh, would you say that you are uh, entrepreneurial in spirit or a craftsman in spirit? And not that you, not that those are mutually exclusive, but I'm I'm curious uh, because you do seem to have a pretty um, uh, uh, nimble business sense. Yes, I have been running businesses for quite a long time. Um, businesses meaning uh, maybe a lemonade stand, you know, selling lemonade, selling stuff at school that I made, uh, you know, just just stuff like that. I've always uh, had that uh, mindset for business and for uh, creating stuff and for contributing uh, 
positive things to the world through business. Uh, so yes, I am a craftsman, but I have a, a very strong mindset for the entrepreneur. So uh, the two come in hand. Uh, so they, they work very well together. Uh, but that business mindset has definitely been with me for quite a long time. Yeah, that's like having a law degree, you know, with a business sense, you can you can do anything. And, um, you know, I've actually I've spoken to a lot of people on this show who have been pretty business savvy. So I, I don't have many examples to point to, but I could see how one could get lost in the pleasure and the struggle and the frustration of the creative side of things, making the knives. But but figuring out how to grow your business, um, that's another you know, that's another aspect altogether. Right. Yeah. There's, there's all sorts of stuff to look at, uh, when I am both, uh, passionate for business, but also I have an interest in the product itself. Um, but through all of it, it's, it's really comes down to one thing, constant improvement. When I was in the shed during the summertime, that was really when my mind was working, really thinking, man, how can I improve what I'm doing now so I can be in a, in a better shop, so I can be out of the 100 degree temperature making <laughs> knives. Uh, so that's it's stuff like that. I think uh, all business owners need all, all people need, they need those, uh, those tough times, you know, uh, being mm -hmm. in the spot you don't necessarily want to be in. Uh, but for all of it, I, I learned something. I enjoyed it at the time. I made the most of it. Of course, we had a lot of great times in that shed, you know, the team, uh, we, we had a, a lot of great, uh, days in in that shop but uh the mind is always looking for the next uh the best thing the next uh improvement you know so uh, the the two uh come together very well oh yeah uh so uh in terms of automating to make yourself more you know as you strive for this improvement and uh and especially when you're talking about process some of that might mean automating um how how have you considered that possibility yes so since i am a one-man show the more efficient the better while maintaining quality so i've looked at a few things like a water jet cutting the blanks instead of cutting them out with an angle grinder which i had done every year before uh so that helps uh, right now i do all the g10 scales by hand so a cnc machine uh, is my next addition so i can cut everything out with a machine and it's pretty much like another employee it's working while i'm doing something else um then uh, we'll get on to the online part of it, the, the social media, the content. Uh, I schedule a lot of that stuff. So um, uh, whenever I have an idea, you know, I just come up with it, put it in the schedule. And uh, that way stuff is always coming out. And um, so that's another platform working for me uh, all the time. Um, there's all sorts of stuff I look at to, to make the process uh, faster, but also improve quality, if not maintain it at the same time. Yeah, that was something you mentioned in your uh, letter to me in, in the box here was that um, yes. you, were, you were looking to um, automate the production of your handle scales using CNC. And uh, I've spoken to a number of fixed blade makers and um, who do that. And I think that that is a very, it, it's a, it's a brilliant solution to what I, I have a feeling is an arduous part of the process. Uh, you know, yes. and, and you do want to, especially with ergonomics, you don't want to mess around too much with that. You don't want to rush it, you know, when you're doing it by hand and you want to make sure that it's right. And that every knife that everyone picks up feels basically the same. So, um, right. Yeah. And, uh, that's, that's a part of handmade knives. Um, I'll actually show you one here. This was from 2018 here i brought this so this was the first line of knives by shed knives so if you have seen which i know you have seen the the 2023 uh box and what comes with it but for all of you who are watching the the new line looks much better than this but this is what i was doing at the time um so you can see the improvement over the time this is what i was first doing uh you know cutting it out by hand 
doing the mm. 550 cord, uh, working on a small uh, one by 30 Harbor Freight belt sander, you know, just something I could get my hands on. Um, compared to that 2023 US Tonto you have, um, yeah. which I actually have one as well right here. Over time, I look for ways to constantly improve, like I said, and, uh, you know, ways to, to make the knife better. And yes, making it by hand is great. This is a handmade knife, but finding uh, other resources to use that just enhance the knife. Yes, this is still handmade, but I found other uh, ways to enhance it. Um, so that's something I've also thought about. The more I move into machines like CNC scales, water jet blanks, stuff like that, um, the, the farther I, away I go from handmade knives, um, but really the core uh, focus of a knife is cutting, it's using it. And um, that's where it comes down to, you know, it's okay to have a machine make some of the process, you know, um, because it will later on enhance uh, the, the person's a time who's actually using it you know it'll they'll have a better experience uh because i've used uh, better processes throughout the years yeah no doubt um you you can you can tell uh, that a knife has been zero like the the design efficiency has been zeroed in on when you're using it and you know that that only comes from um that sort of constant uh you know, looking, looking at you, looking over and over and over. That's something I ask some people uh, is, do you want to have a knife company that produces a whole bunch of different models? Or do you want to be a knife company that has a couple of models that you keep uh, redoing and redoing, like the difference between a Topps knives and a Chris Reeve knives, you know, where everything is. Uh, uh, but in your case, it kind of sounds like you're, you're bringing those two models together. Yes, that's right. Uh, I talking about how many models are in the selection. I have, uh, of course, looked at the tops knife selection. I, I know the tops teams are a great group of guys, and uh, they do have quite a lot of models in the selection. Yeah. They they've got what three uh, high three hundreds, uh, low four hundreds. They they have a ton of models, um, where. I, at least for me, for my goals in, in business, uh, I find, you know, let me stick to the best. Let me narrow it down um, and improve on those. But as time goes on, I will make more and more knives and more and more models. Um, but I think for the for long term uh, planning and for what I'd like to achieve in, in business here in this industry, is stick with uh, the best knives for the task. I don't need to go out having thousands and thousands of models. Just have the best. You don't need a ton of models when you have the best. Well, okay, maybe that answers the question, but what do you want? How would you lay that out? What do you want to achieve in this industry? Uh, yes. Yeah, so really the, the end goal is if you are a knife enthusiast, you carry a shed knives knife that's really the end goal uh like the buck 110 everyone's got a buck 110 or at least you know someone who has a buck 110 so that that's a classic in in the knife industry as we know and uh my long-term goal is shed knives becomes that classic everyone has one of my knives in their collection so really that that's it so <laughs> yeah so uh, here's a question. How are you prepared to, or or what do you think of customer feedback? You'll have people, no doubt, who say, oh, that grind is too low. You know, I need something slicey. Or, um, you know, or who say, uh, we need you to, to, or we want you to use a different steel uh, because we're really into this steel. And then that forces you into a, a, a different sort of protocol because you're going to have to heat treat and and do different things because you you struck gold uh getting getting a steel that doesn't require that um yeah so so how how are you prepared to evolve for that kind of eventuality yes so as you know customers desires and and what what we knife enthusiasts like is always changing and mm -hmm. 
businesses need to change as fast, if not faster, uh, than the customers uh, change in interest. So uh, when people come to me and say, "Hey, uh, I like how the how the grind is great," well, now I know. I had a dozen people say that, let me keep it. Or if I have people say, you know, Jack, the Kydex sheaths are cool, but we actually like leather. Then boom, I just move right back to leather. Um, and I have all sorts of backups ready to go. I have designs. I, I call it the Shed Knives Vault. There's all sorts of designs, all sorts of stuff in, in the vault uh, that's just ready to roll out. So when a customer... Uh, interest changes for, for the masses because uh, each person has their own uh, niche uh, preferences, you know. Um, right. But for the masses, I'm ready to, to roll out with whatever they want to change because um, at the end of the day, it's the customer who uses it. It's the customer who buys. So I got to make what they want. Ah, yes. Give the people what they want. Absolutely. That's right. um, that's that's what that's what people want to hear, especially knife makers or not knife makers, knife hoarders. I mean, buyers <laughs> like myself. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, because, um, you know, being totally honest to use this to its maximum potential, which I haven't yet. But just in taking it out and thumping it, totally extracurricular behavior for me. That's not it does. That is not part of my lifestyle other than I think it's fun to do. Um, so. Uh, but for someone who really does rely on a tough knife like this, um, you know, they're going to want to know that you're listening, you know. That's and right. So, so what what are your ways of listening and uh, receiving feedback? Yes. So uh, if you've bought a knife for, for those of you watching, if you've bought a knife from Shed Knives in the past few months, uh, I always send an email out right after you order a knife online. And uh, I ask, well, how'd you hear about us? Because uh, that helps see what I'm doing good, what, what's working. And then later on, uh, there's all sorts of opportunities I put out there for customers to give their feedback. Um, I do surveys. You get a discount code. You get 15 20% off down the road. Um, I do posts on social media asking, oh, what do you like about that? The Atlas will say, what do you like about the Skewer? Uh, what's your favorite knife? Stuff like that. And then uh, I'm also taking a look at what other companies are doing, what mm. other people are saying. Um, I'm connected to quite a few different companies. So I have, I guess you could say, an inside uh, knowledge there on what's going on behind the scenes, what feedback other companies are hearing. So that way, um, I'm, I'm a big um, uh, fan of, you know, let me see what is going on in other places first before just running in and, and rushing to it. I don't rush to failure. Uh, so I see what's happening, analyze and uh, adjust from there. So there's all sorts of opportunities for people to uh, give their feedback and, Hey, I like the knife. Hey, uh, we could adjust this. Then great. Let's do it. So you have, um, you know, you indicated you have a lot of friends at knife companies. That's great uh, to have, no doubt, because knife makers are some of the coolest people I've met. Um, but in terms of, <clears throat> excuse me, the rest of the community, the knife buying community and and yes. uh, and the peanut gallery online, what has <laughs> <laughs> what has the uh, feedback been from or, or what are your feelings and take on the knife community? Yeah, on the knife community, well, uh, like I mentioned, uh, interests are always changing. Oh, my goodness. Um, I noticed uh, the community, that a lot of people are going after the, the Benchmade bug out type of knife. A lot of people are going for that style. That seems to be uh, something that's trendy now, uh, at least for what I see. Um but uh, yeah, there's, oh my goodness, I didn't even know where to start. There's all sorts of stuff going on. Um, but uh, I I guess to answer that a little bit more, how I find that stuff, um, online, forums, knife forums, knife pages, uh, even 
uh, some of the Shed Knives platforms, really all the platforms, they've turned into really nice communities where people can uh, connect with like-minded individuals. Like, for example, the Shed Knives TikTok, people are always talking to each other. Oh, did you see this knife came out? Did you see that model? It might not even be from Shed Knives. It might be from somewhere else, but I'm still seeing, okay, great. This is trendy. Oh, they want to see this improvement. So, there's all sorts of stuff going on. I definitely miss uh, most of the info, but if I can catch on to, to some of the key points, then great. Uh, have, have you felt support uh, from the general knife public? You know what I mean? Um, yes. I, I, I feel like there is a it's a supportive crowd out there. Oh, for sure. Yes, definitely supportive. Um, I was actually at a, a show a couple weeks ago and I, I guess now about a month ago and a guy came up to the table he's like hey jack i remember when you were outside selling knives in in the parking lot um <laughs> and when it was your first show and uh, back in 2019 and uh he was very supportive and just stuff like that it's like man the, the people they're so supportive even at the very start um maybe the knives weren't the best but the idea, they like the idea. So uh, there's all sorts of support. And I'm so thankful for that. I mean, seriously, there's been so many people uh, over the years and even now that are here to support uh, both me and all sorts of uh, knife makers out there. So there really is a great support in the community. You're going to be at Blade Show this year, right? That's right. Yes. Awesome. Oh, I look forward to meeting you in person. I, I love Blade Show. This will only be my third year going. Um, but, oh, man, it's been – I love that that show. Yes, it is awesome. Yeah, it's my uh, third year as well, uh, second year as a vendor. And, nice. uh, yes, it's, it's an awesome place. And that's really where I get a lot of customer feedback and, and what people like, what trends are, are in. So Blade Show, it is the place to be. Yep, yep. So uh, make sure everyone you're gonna you'll be at a table over uh, on that uh, on that big uh, area of tables on the right. Oh uh, no, no. I'll be uh, twenty four sixteen. I'll be in the smaller room. Uh, oh, there. oh I've yeah. Got, uh, I'll, I've got a corner and then an inline there. So nice big setup. There is seating as well, so you can uh, oh, cool. have a place to sit. So at the Shed Knives booth. That's right. I I love that room. That's where I spend most of my money. <laughs> oh, well, Actually. we're right there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right there. Hey, um, so uh, you're a young man. Uh, I, anyone with eyes can can see that. And uh, and we know that you've been doing this um, for, you know, uh, a, a short ish period of time. But you've definitely um, formed a, a brand identity you've formed uh, a really nice catalog of knives. I've had a chance to experience your work and put it through its paces. Your product is good. And um, so, and, and you're looking at things from an earlier uh, stance in your life. What kind of advice would you give your peers? Uh, people who are just, you know, about your age or, or, you know, they don't have to be your age, but someone who's young and coming out and thinks they might want to start a business. Um, a business in knives or a business at all what what kind of advice would you give them sure well i would give a few things first off find something you want to achieve find a goal find a long-term goal of uh, pick an industry uh, and usually that's where the goals come from pick an industry if it's the knife industry pick a goal in the knife industry and uh, then just stick with it and that's what i've done just stick to that goal and uh, that's that's what i recommend you can't go wrong with that just no matter what limit the distractions just constant improvement just find a way to achieve the goal if you work hard enough i guarantee it can be done because I, I've done it before. The small goals, uh, the, the small wins lead to the big wins. So uh, really, really, that's what I would recommend. Uh, but I guess some more uh, personal advice, uh, enjoy the process as well. Don't be so focused on that end goal. Uh, a, a quote I, I use all the time is the man uh, who 
enjoys walking uh, walks farther than the man who enjoys the destination. So uh, enjoy the process, enjoy what you do, and uh, no matter what, just stick with it. Pick the right thing and stick with it. Yeah, Jack, but I don't have a 2 by 72 grinder. I can't make knives. <laughs> well, there's all sorts of options. I started with a palm sander, and then it, it came from there. I got an angle grinder, so then I could cut my own blanks out. Uh, get creative. You don't necessarily need to sell stuff. You can trade it. That's what I did. I, I wasn't at the point to sell knives, so I would trade them. I'd get better machines. Um, just... Just get creative. There's all sorts of ideas out there. There's always a solution. You have to have a, a revolving door of solutions. That's that's what I say all the time. You got to have a revolving door of solutions because life is a revolving door of problems. <laughs> you got that right. And on that note, Jack, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. I really appreciate it. It was nice meeting you and talking about your knives and, and, and getting your uh, business sense there. Awesome. Well, it was great to, to be on the show. Thank you very much. My pleasure. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Don't take dull for an answer. It's the Knife Junkie's favorite sign-off phrase, and now you can get that tagline on a variety of merchandise, like a t-shirt, sweatshirt, hoodie, long-sleeve tee, and more, even on coasters, tote bags, a coffee mug, water bottle, and stickers. Let everyone know that you're a Knife Junkie and that you don't take dull for an answer. Get yours at thenifejunkie.com slash dull and shop for all of your Knife Junkies merchandise at thenifejunkie.com slash shop. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Jack Billings of Shed Knives. We know he has a bright future in knives. Uh, I also think he has a bright future in motivational speaking. Uh, I liked that last bit about the revolving door of solutions because, yes, there are a revolving door of problems. Join us next week for another great conversation. And uh, don't forget about Wednesday for the midweek supplemental and then Thursday, Thursday Night Knives, right here, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. For Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, thenifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at thenifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on thenifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at thenifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at thenifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.